In the 17th century, an inspiring host gathered people together, the purpose to increase their knowledge through conversation. These gatherings were called salons. Guests would debate a topic for the evening, mostly books, then eat and drink tea. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the fourth installment of the High Tea with the Vice Chancellor. My name is Litokwa George Mbedi. I'm Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Johannesburg. Thank you once again for setting time aside to come and have this conversation uh, with us. I also want to thank our guest uh, this afternoon, Mr. Jonathan Ansam. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Jonathan, ladies and gentlemen, is a journalist, editor, and author. Um, um, that has won awards, breaking news, feature writing, and creative uh, writing. He has also written The, Vic the Victor Within, Spy Uncovering uh, Craig Williamson, Betrayal, The Secret Lives of Apartheid Spies, and Joining the Dots, The Unauthorized Biography of Pravin Gordon. Thank you so much for setting time aside to be with us. Ladies and gentlemen, already at this early stage, I would like to let you know that the book that we are going to discuss today is available for sale there at the, um, at the corner there at the end of the hall. And um, uh, Jonathan has kindly agreed to autograph uh, the books um, afterwards. Of course, after you have bought your copy, of course. I have brought my own copy and I'm looking forward to you autographing this. Really, this is, is a special moment. The book that we are discussing this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, is a book by the title Manchus in the Trenches, Jewish Foot Soldiers in the Anti-Apartheid Struggle. So what is this book all about? Um, I must tell you, I didn't know about the book. For some reason, I missed it. I'm a bookworm. For some reason, I missed it. And I had a wonderful um, um, you know, breakfast with uh, colleagues from the uh, South African Jewish Board of Deputies, uh, Ms. Wendy Khan and other colleagues. And we're talking about this high tea, about books. I brought a, a book that we did uh, on uh, Santa Claus, uh, believe it or not. But we look at Santa Claus from law, uh, you know, decolonization for IR and COVID-19. And we talked about this. They say there's an interesting book and they kindly made a copy available uh, to me in my office. And here we are. Thank you so much for making this possible. And they said they'll liaise with you. And, and here we are today discussing uh, this interesting book. So thank you so much. So ladies and gentlemen, many of you may be wondering now, what is this book all about? Um, from the title, I would say, you know, the title is self-explanatory, but we have the author here today that can elaborate on that. It, it is about members of the Jewish community, the way I understand it, who, who played an important role in the struggle against apartheid in, in, in South Africa. And, and uh, as you know, this struggle, you know, um, affected um, many people in different ways. And if you look at the people that are covered in this book and the issues that are covered, you'll see that, you know, here we're talking about some people that could have said, you know, could have stayed out of it, but they couldn't stand in injustice and they went into the trenches, as the title uh, suggests. Um, this book, of course, is about the struggle, which is the struggle ag against apartheid, and I dare say, which affected almost all aspects of life, including, you know, in the labor market. We've got uh, people who played an important role in dealing with workers' issues. We've got people, you know, who fought, you know, for uh, the working class. It covers areas such as arts, you know, in terms of the great work that uh, some of the uh, people, uh, you know, the work that they've done, and also, you know, areas such as justice, you know, where people went straight you know, to courts to also defend the rights of those that were charged you know, in terms of apartheid laws. Jonathan, I'll tell you, before I read the book, I spent some time in Germany. I spent three years in Munich. And when I saw Mensch, I thought of the German word Mensch, which means a human. But when I read the book, I understood this very well. And I like it. You know, and I'll refer to this later on where you explain clearly that um, 
the way this word is used, Menches, is um, you know a, a Yiddish-derived expression indicating someone who's decent. Listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. Someone who's decent, principled, and strives to do the right thing. Let me repeat this. Somebody who's decent, principled, and strives to do the right thing. How many people today can we call principled? How many people can we say they're decent and at the same time that they strive to do what is right? It's something that I want us to keep in mind for later on, hopefully for our discussions and we can talk about this because at the end you'll hear me. Really, I feel this is something that we need to take out there to say those that fought you know, in the trenches then, they did what they had, they had to do then. What would they say today, Jonathan, if they see what is happening today? How can we make sure that... Um, we have more people who are decent, principled, you know, and, and principled and who strive to do the right thing. The book, ladies and gentlemen, as the former president, you know, President Tabumbiki has put it in the forward, and I quote him, it's a roll call of some um, of those who contributed in various ways to the struggle to defeat apartheid tyranny is a roll call of Jewish heroes and heroes, both well known and unsung. And obviously, I would say, what, what is it that I personally learned from, from this book? You know? Firstly, I said to myself, there are many people who did so much that we know too little about. I didn't know about a lot of people, I won't pretend. And some I could say, oh, this is the father of you know, Judge Sachs. You know? Oh, this is related to this one. Some I con confused. You know, when I read about Dennis Davis, uh, I thought it was Judge Dennis Davis. But then there's a part where um, you indicate that um, he passed on and I say, no, Judge David, Dennis Davis is alive. But you know, it's also those things that one really clarifies and understands as, and when one reads the book. So it's about the sung and unsung heroes and heroines, known and unknown uh, heroes and her uh, heroines. There might be a lot, and I dare say there is a lot. Earlier on, before we started with this conversation, I spoke to Jonathan, I said, uh, I, 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 I suspect there is more that must be covered. And as I read this book, it reminded me of a Netflix series, I think the title is El Rey, where this musician growing up has a friend who sadly passes on, and the mother of this musician says, um, he's not dead, he will only be dead when we forget about him. So people don't die, they only die when we forget about them. And I say with this book, all the people you have covered, those that uh, my, uh, have certainly passed on, they are not dead, they will never be forgotten uh, by, by, by this book. Um, the issue of the food soldiers, you know, choosing not to be silent on Lucas. Today I believe we can learn from this book uh, one important lesson that it's not about the bad things people do to us. It's not about the bad things people do for us. It's about what we do in response to that. If we choose to become silent on Lucas, then the problem shifts. It's not about them. It's about us doing nothing about the problem. And I'm not saying we should go out there and be uh, destructive, but we need to talk about things. We need to bring our part to ensure that we choose to be part of the solution, as is also indicated in the book. Ladies and gentlemen, apartheid, as many of you know, caused untold suffering for many people. I mean, the pain and damage it caused, particularly to young families and especially children, is incredible. And as I read the book, I thought, hmm, to the extent that this may not be well documented, perhaps the time has come for the impact, you know, of, you know, apartheid and how those that fought apartheid were treated, particularly children, the pain that they've suffered, that it be well documented. I was deeply touched as a father in the part where you refer to, um, you know, what one of the uh, children of one of the Levy, I hope I pronounce him correctly, Levy twins, who, when the dad came back uh, from prison, had a dead bird, and, you know, when the father saw the children after prison, and one of the children saying, I remember him being pale, and he looked like dirty snow. That's incredible, eh? 
we just had snow, ladies and gentlemen, so at least we have a sense of what dirty snow looked like, uh, or you have an idea. But those who have seen really dirty snow, you can imagine the trauma that this child, this, as a father, I think it was the saddest thing a child can go through. Of course, there are also funny moments that the person I personally, and, and as strange as it may sound, enjoyed, especially uh, one of the food soldiers, so he sucks. I would say of all the people, being a lawyer by training, but I found him quite interesting. Not successful in many areas, particularly private life, but in the area of organizing people, and resilient and being determined, incredible. This, um, and what I found quite, and I don't have a dirty mind, but I have to share this, where when he was um, arrested, you know, for leading a, a, a protest, and the women chanting out, say, his name is Sachs. And the lady saying, we want sex, we want sex. <laughs> and people thinking they want something that I don't want to explain. <laughs> but the other thing that um, one of my colleagues, a senior professor, talked to me, says, are you still alive? For a moment, I said, do you want me to be dead? Then I remembered in the book, also because he received so many death threats, it became a standard thing, sort of, that when people greeted him, they would say, are you still alive? When um, he passed on, I think it's him, who passed on overseas in the UK, and somebody said, oh, if God exists, he's probably now having an argument with him. <laughs> so, so this is one of the funny moments. What, we are going through a difficult time, ladies and gentlemen. We are going through a rough patch, and I often ask myself, these food soldiers that gave so much, you know, that could have said and said, look, it's, n it's none of our business. But that, as mentors, you know, they wanted to do the right thing. Um, what would they say wherever they are? You interacted with many of them, and I'm wondering what they would have said, you know, seeing what we are going through. What would they say to us, um, you know, um, in terms of, um, you know, what we are going through? Any message to fellow South Africans, they would have said, soldier on. Or, or, or be like us, because they did their part. It's time for us now to make sure that their hard-won freedom is not lost, is not squandered. So really through this book, I will tell you, you made all these foot soldiers to remain alive. They will never be forgotten, and thank you so much. And um, with those few uh, words, ladies and gentlemen, it's not about me, it's about us engaging with the author and also taking uh, contributions, questions, comments from uh, those who have joined us online. We really value that and so that we can engage and take the valuable lessons, you know. And in the process, ladies and gentlemen, keep these food soldiers alive because it will only be when they are forgotten that they will die. So thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, I'll open this for engagement, but also give you, um, you know, some time to share your thoughts and also maybe starting with a question I ask, what would they be saying, you know, seeing what is happening and then, and then we can engage and take questions from um, colleagues. Welcome and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. I, I really feel very privileged to be here and sitting with you. Um, I, I, maybe if I can just set the scene a little bit about uh, how this book came about. Um, it, it was after the hard lockdown. My um, work up at, up at, at the moment had, had been working, looking at spies, terrible people, most of them. Some of them were, were, were spying for the, for the good cause, but most of them spying, uh, putting people in prison, uh, uh, doing terrible things. And you kind of lose a lot of... Uh, uh, sort of respect for humanity when you're only writing about people who are assassinating children and doing those sorts of things. And then I, I got a phone call saying that, that somebody, um, Trevor Mahali, had started this project um, and unfortunately hadn't been able to continue and would I be interested in taking it over? And um, I was very interested. <laughs> it was an opportunity to write about good people, people who had made a difference, people who had contributed and had you know, made the world a better place. And I think that ultimately is what a mensch does. A mensch leaves the world a better place than when they uh, came into the world. And it gave me an opportunity to meet 
and, and I didn't also know a lot about them, uh, and, and we had to find them. We, we, we didn't want to uh, profile the high-profile people because people know about them. They're not forgotten. But we wanted to uh, 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 look at people who are in danger of being forgotten or people that we just don't know about. And that set the course, and it was such a kind of valuable project to go and find these people. And at the end of it, I felt very, very enriched, and my life had, had been changed, and I felt quite inspired by, by their activism. So I think, um, and, and um, um, uh, two of the people that I met, the identical twins, uh, Norman and Leon Levy, um, and it was Norman's son who had, who had found the bird, um, but uh, and Norman wrote a book called um, The Final Prize, um, and th they were identical twins who had been really giants of the struggle. I, I, if I had to ask, does anybody, has anybody heard of the names Norman and Leon Levy? There's some nods, which is good. Uh, okay. <laughs> but some nods, which is, which is good. But, but Norman... Um, uh, 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 was in prison um, in the Bram Fischer trial. Uh, he was convicted. Leon w was a member and the president of the South African Congress of Trade Unions. And Leon is still alive. He is the, the last living signatory of the Freedom Charter. Um, and these were people that I, I didn't really know about. I maybe sort of read about, but I didn't know their... Incredible, the incredible sacrifices that they had made. And um, anyway, Norman had written this book called The Final Prize, and the final prize for, for Norman was liberation. And when I went to go and speak to him, he said, well, we, we're not quite there yet. Yes, we've won political power, and, and there's a democracy, but we're not quite there yet. But he says he, he was 90 years old at the time, and he said to me, but now, you know, me and Leon, they're identical twins, we're too old to, to fight. It's time for younger people to get involved. And I think that's what they would say. They would want people to be inspired by their activism, by their, their contribution. And I think they would be disappointed at, at, at where the country is at the moment. But I think they wouldn't be discouraged. They would keep on encouraging people to get involved, to make changes, small changes individually, be part of community groups, but get involved. Um, thank you so much. I was taking notes about all the great, um, you know, words of wisdom that we are sharing. I mean, a mensch, ladies and gentlemen, leaves the world a better place. That is deep, isn't it? And also that they will be disappointed, but not discouraged. You know, it's, it's, it's just like um, if you fall, you know, you, you must stand up, dust yourself, and be Johnny Walker. Keep on, <laughs> keep on walking. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for those words of wisdom. I would like to open this now for your comments, questions, and so on. We have the author here. He flew from Cape Town, ladies and gentlemen, to engage with us. Let's make this count. <laughs> Um, when I first moved to Cape Town um, in 2008, um, I, I, I started at the Cape Times, w uh, working at the Cape Times, and um, I was at a party, and somebody came up to me and said, um, what's your name? And I said, I'm Jonathan. And they said, uh, and what do you do? And I said, I'm a journalist. And they said, oh, are you the Jonathan? And I felt very, very... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> my head swelled about three degrees and I said yes and they said oh but um, uh, you know how do you come up with your brilliant ideas every week and I said oh well you know <laughs> um, and it turned out that they were talking about Jonathan Shapiro um, it, it got a little bit more dangerous because I, I happened to go to KwaZulu Natal, this was after Shapiro had that famous Rape of Justice um, cartoon, and um, it, 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 he was receiving death threats, and um, there was a lot of people who were very angry with him, and I was in the hotel signing out, and suddenly um, somebody starts shouting across the, the, the room, hey Shapiro, hey Shapiro, and I turn around and somebody's looking at me, and they'd confused me with Shapiro, 
And um, a whole lot of people came, and I had to try and convince them, no, no, I'm not. And apparently at that point in our lives, the, the two of us looked very similar. Uh, and, uh, at, you know, if you're going to have a doppelganger, make sure that he's not on, a, on death lists. <laughs> But yes, um, I, there is a section on, on journalists in, in, in the book. We, we talk uh, a, a profile, Benjamin Pogrand, um, who was uh, uh, the, the deputy editor of the Rand Daily Mail, and then um, uh, Erwin Manoyam and Anton Harbour, who then started the Weekly Mail. And I, do, I, 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 I think we do reference uh, Zapira in, in the book as, as one of the Jewish activists that was involved, but there isn't a chapter on him. So we had to be kind of selective about the, the people that we, we profiled. And um, I've, we felt that Benjamin Pogrant, although fairly well known, um, his story hadn't really been told. And I, I, uh, the, the Weekly Mail, we, we identified Owen Manoyam, who was sort of identified as the invisible editor. And uh, people know a lot about Anton Harbour, but Erwin Manoyam was the person in the background. And we were really trying to profile people in the background who had played a role but hadn't, um, uh, you know, that they weren't always in the spotlight. Okay. Thank you, that's a really good question. Um, I think a lot of them that I spoke to, they always, even though it got very, very difficult, and um, a lot of them were imprisoned, a lot of them tortured, um, a lot of them went into exile, uh, some went underground, and I think they always believed that freedom would come, and I think that's what kept them going, that it was a commitment, and um, you, you know, it, it, the, the thing about being mentioned, doing the right thing, it's about doing the right thing even when it's very, very difficult. And it's under those very difficult circumstances that, that you do the right thing. It's not easy, it's not popular, but you have to, you know, you do it because of those reasons. Um, and I think that is w w what kept them going. They always believed that what they were doing was the right thing, even though they were ostracized um, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and they had lots of personal sacrifices that they, they, that, that, that they made. But they did it nonetheless. And I think that, that, that was the lesson that I learned, is that even when it's very difficult to be a mentor, it, it's, it's at that time when you have to do the right thing. And I think it was. It, it, it was a commitment to this belief that they had, that they, they can make a difference, they will make a difference. And... Um, the commitment to uh, uh, one day, they believed that one day they will succeed. It, um, I, rem I remember speaking to um, um, uh, um, <laughs> Barney, the astronomer, I've just forgot, Barney Fanner, Bernie Fanneroff, um, and he said to me that they were always discussing about, you know, one day when liberation comes, I think this was even in the 80s, and they were talking about, you know, 30, 40 years' time when liberation comes. But that's what kept them going. They didn't realize that, that, that they would, you know, see it so soon. But it, it, it was the final prize that, that, that motivated them. Um, I, I think it, it's very true that uh, it's sort of uh, dominated by men. Um, we, they, we, we do include a, a few women, um, including um, the woman who um, had a left-wing bookshop um, uh, 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 and some students who got involved and some educators. But, uh, and, and, of course, Selma Brody, um, the doctor, and uh, um, she was many things. Um, so, so that we, 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 but definitely not represented enough. Um, I think that was just the, the sort of hustle and bustle of, of trying to find people. Um, but, but, but yes, I, 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 I absolutely agree with you that there should be, we should have more books and there should be more books about women that, that, that are featured. Um, there is a common thread um, in, 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 in speaking to a lot of these people, in fact, probably all of them, 
that the Holocaust, some of them, um, like Franz Auerbach, actually uh, uh, came out of Nazi Germany. He left uh, when he was 13. Um, some of them, uh, Solis Sachs, uh, uh, escaped the, the, the pogroms in, in Eastern Europe. And so there is that sense of growing up. And, and, and of course, their children would have grew up in, in the shadow of the Holocaust. And I think that definitely plays a role in, in, in their commitment to, to um, uh, 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 human rights causes. Um, I, I, another thing that I think, a lesson that, that I can draw from, is, is that a lot of them were, were, were fleeing immigrants and um, th th they really placed a, a, a value in education. And I think th th that um, they realized that your money can be taken away from you, your possessions can be taken away from you, you can be kicked out of your country, your country, your citizenship can be taken away from you, but your knowledge can never be taken away from you. And I think that is a lesson that, 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 that I took from this book, is how important education and knowledge is. And I think one of the reasons that they did become involved and, and became very progressive is that they placed this emphasis on education and um, it opened up their minds. They read books, they, in the, you know, they formed um, social clubs um, and they became open-minded. And I think th that was also one of the... I suppose, the sort of legacies of that time. But definitely a lot of them, they felt, uh, uh, you know, they didn't want to wake up in a South Africa where their children said to them, what did you do? Um, and I think there, there, there was a sense of people waking up in Germany and said, well, what did you do? We, you know, it's very difficult for anybody to say that they didn't know what was going on in South Africa. Um, you, you couldn't not know how terrible things were. Um, and, and I think they felt that they couldn't say, I, I, you know, I, I didn't know. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. While the microphone goes to Prof. Nzalazi, I can't get enough of this <laughs> Sony Sachs. Ladies no. and gentlemen, you would say, who would say this about himself? No, no. The, the last part, of course, of calling himself ugly. He would say, I'm a Jew. There's nothing wrong with that, please. I have a rough voice. There's nothing wrong with that. And a Lithuanian accent. Nothing wrong with that. Then he says, I'm ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm ugly, but I wouldn't go, I'm handsome. It ends there. <laughs> I can't get enough of solid sex. <laughs> Oh, it's a, it's a very difficult question. Um, I, I, I think the pockets of hope, uh, if I can say that, I, I think we, it, it is a, we are in a very difficult time. I think um, there's, there's a lot of unemployment, there's poverty, we've just gone through a lot of corruption. Um, but I, I, I think not all is lost. Um, and I think the, the, the young people, and I'm hoping young people that are sitting here, are feeling like they can pick up the mantle, th th they can contribute, um, th they can be productive, they can be constructive. Um, so I, I'd like to think that, that, that maybe there's still a spark. And I, I do see that. I, you know, I, I, I think that there are lots of young people who are very, very impressive and who are doing wonderful things and, and who are getting involved and who are trying to make the world better and the country better. Um, I just wish that there were you know, sort of more opportunities and there were more people doing wonderful things. But um, I, 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 I don't say that it's hopeless, um, but I, I think, uh, you know, we just need a... a, 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 a much more inspiration and, 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 and many more people just following in, in, in the, the footsteps of, of not only the, the, obviously the Jewish activists, but all the activists. And all of them, you know, a lot of them who, who are very well known, but lots of them that are unsung, um, who, who, who made huge contributions, who made enormous sacrifices. Um, and I think maybe, you know, 
to pay the debt to them to, to, so that their sacrifices uh, weren't in vain. Um, but it, I think it, it is a collective effort. I think it's an individual effort and a collective effort. And I think, um, you know, you know th- th- there have been many di- other struggles that have taken place. Uh, I just, just, you know, the, 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 the kind of the, 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 the you know, the, HIV, the, the, the struggle against HIV and AIDS and, uh, you know, the, the birth of, of a very, very dynamic uh, civil society that's got involved. Um, but I think it, 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 we, we shouldn't be discouraged. Sorry, it was a very difficult question. I'm not sure I answered it. <laughs> Uh, in fact, Benjamin Pogrand, the, the person I was referring to, uh, he mentions him in, 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 the, in the chapter, and he's devoted a lot of his life. He was friends with him, and he devoted a lot of his time to write a, about Sabukwe. So, uh, and he was very inspired by him. Um, so I, I think maybe the, you know, the, the, that chapter would be uh, of interest. Yeah. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, I, th- I think for some people, a lot of the people, um, all the people are identified as Jewish, but it's, it's a very difficult question to ask, ask you know, what is it to be Jewish and, and who decides? Um, but they, they, they all had a Jewish identity, but not all of them were religious. In fact, some of them weren't religious at all, and some of them said, you know, they were incidentally Jewish, that they, were, they felt but by tradition and by culture, they were Jewish. But there is a section on, on some of the rabbis who had played a role. Um, um, and I think for them, it was their, it was their faith that, that um, inspired them to get involved. Um, not all the, the you know, it's, it's also not, uh, it's important, I think, to acknowledge that not every single Jewish person was anti-apartheid. And some people did not do anything. Um, you know, that, that is the truth. That is what happened. Um, and not all the religious leaders were anti-apartheid, but some of them were, and at great costs. You know, some of them, the, the, the community didn't want to get involved. Some of them were scared of, of, of um, kind of, you know, if you get involved, you're in, inviting anti-Semitism. But some of them were really brave. And we do highlight, I think there are about six or seven rabbis who stood up and, and, and uh, were counted. And it was because of their faith that inspired them to get involved. And uh, rabbis across the, 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 the spectrum, orthodox and reform and progressive. Yeah, so uh, absolutely, Ben Turok is a mention. He is mentioned in, in the book, but in, in passing, again, not a, a chapter uh, devoted to him. But uh, you know, uh, we, we didn't. The, the one thing that we didn't want to do was just to have lists of names. We wanted to try and bring these people out and 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 make them come alive with the work that they did, um, uh, and trying to understand what motivated them to get involved. And in order to do that, we, we needed some space uh, uh, to profile them. So a lot of people were left out. Some, you know, obviously there were some people who were quite un, uh, you know, unimpressed about being left out. And uh, uh, I, I did get some um, kind of emails and, you know, what about my aunt and what about my brother and what about... It, it was just impossible to, to highlight everybody. Um, the, the, the book is an acknowledgement of the mention, but it, 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 it doesn't, in so far as some of the people talk about how uh, 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 they were disappointed that, the, that they weren't supported by the official Jewish uh, community, how in some cases they were ostracized, um, it doesn't shy away from the fact that there were people who didn't get involved. Um, but it, it, it doesn't focus, that's not the focus of the book. Um, so 
it, 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 it profiles the people who got involved and uh, the, 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 you know, their motives um, and the sacrifices that they made, some of them being ostracized by the, their own communities. Um, but it, 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 it doesn't kind of look into some of the Jewish people who, who, who supported apartheid, um, etc. But it doesn't shy away from it either. It's, Um, I, I, I think just, just to talk a little bit about um, the, the anti-Semitism that was in, in this country uh, uh, after, before and after the Second World War. Um, when when um, Franz Auerbach came to South Africa, his father first came to South Africa nine months before he came from Nazi Germany. And um, he, he arrived, I think, on one of the last boats, might even have been the last boat to come to South Africa before they stopped uh, any of the refugees uh, coming. And waiting for him at the docks were students from Stellenbosch University um, uh, spitting, at, they had come to spit at the Jews who were c uh, coming off the, off the boats. And one of them was Favut. Um, he was a professor at the, at the university, I think, at the time. Um, and um, a lot of the people you know, in the National Party at the time, not only wanted to stay neutral in, in the war, but they actually supported the Nazis. So there was a, a sense of anti-Semitism in the National Party, and I think uh, a lot of the Jewish people who had, who had arrived uh, uh, felt discriminated against. So that, so that might have been uh, 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 looking at their identity about where they fitted in, in, in this sort of hierarchy. But I, I think the objective of the book was really to, to, to acknowledge people and celebrate people who had been brave, because as people have pointed out, not everybody was brave. People were scared. People didn't get involved. People didn't want to get involved. But there were a lot of people who wanted to get involved, and they wanted to get involved, and they, the, the acknowledgement didn't matter to them. Because uh, you know, a true mensch doesn't do it to be called a mensch. They, they do it because it's the right thing. And I think that was the objective of the book, is to inspire people, to inspire generations of people, to help people. And, uh, uh, it's also to tell South Africa's history. And I think that, you know, it, it, the book starts um, uh, uh, you know, before apartheid, and it ends in the 90s where student activists, or the 80s where student activists get involved. And, it, and it's trying to understand what motivated people and the contributions that they did make. So I think that was the objective of the book, is to maybe come at history from a slightly different perspective, um, but to celebrate people and, um, who, who were brave. Oh, more difficult questions. <laughs> um, I, I, I think um, just on, the, on the question about whether they feel let down by, I, I, I think they, okay, whether they feel acknowledged. I, I, I think some of them don't feel acknowledged, and, and some of them um, didn't. Most of them didn't mind. You know, they, they, they weren't doing it to be acknowledged. Um, uh, they didn't get involved because they wanted to be... And in fact, uh, Dennis Cooney, one of the lawyers, when I spoke to him and I uh, uh, told him what I was doing and that I wanted to interview him and I explained the project, and he said, you know, he, he didn't feel that he was a hero. He, he, he just did what he had to do. And, uh, and then it, it kind of struck me, because he didn't feel that he should be in the book, that is exactly why he should be in the book. So I, I, I think those were the sorts of people that we were trying to identify and, and profile. Um, uh, whether 
I'm not sure. I'm not. Um, I, I, I'm not really sure. I can answer your second question about whether uh, 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 they feel disappointed that that, that um, other Jewish activists haven't. There haven't been uh, Jewish activists who, who have continued. Um, I think I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know. I, don't, I think you know. Um, I do know that, 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 that Jewish people have got involved in, in, in all sorts of organisations and are doing some uh, good work, but I, I can't say what, uh, who they are or, and what they're doing. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure I can answer that. I'm, you know. So I, I agree with you, people should be acknowledged while they're alive, uh, and a lot of the people uh, are still alive from the book. Um, th uh, three people died, uh, uh, two died, bef I think they all died before the book was published, so after I'd interviewed them and um, before the book was actually published. Um, so I was quite sad about that. Um, uh, uh, but, but that goes to your point about acknowledging people who are doing good while they are alive, and I think more should be done. Um, I think your second question about I, 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 uh, I, yeah, I, I think um, you know Jews are part of South Africa, part of South Africa's community. There's, we're South African. Uh, we are uh, involved in all sorts of kind of issues, uh, uh, we're part of, you know, we, 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 we are citizens and we're part of the kind of the, the life of, of the country. Um, but just like there are other communities, uh, there's a Jewish community that also sort of kind of uh, prays together and gets together. So, um, you know, you know I, I think all people should be writing about uh, uh, um, people who, are, who who have played a role. Um, I, you know, again, I'm not sure I've answered your question. <laughs> I, I I think that's an excellent question to end off with, um, because it's it's it, it's. When we tell stories about inspiring people, um, I, I think it's inspiration uh, begets inspiration. And if, if, if we can share all those stories of all those positive things that are, that, that are taking place, all those NGOs and, and people who are actually getting their hands dirty and getting involved, I think it is very encouraging. And, 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 and seeing success uh, breeds success. And I think so. If, if we if if we just uh, uh, were able to tell more stories about the people who are getting involved and who are uh, uh, doing difficult things and, and in, in difficult circumstances and alleviating poverty where they can, I, I, I think that would be contagious. So if we keep on telling stories about heroes and and, and you know singing about the unsung heroes, I th I, th I, th I think we can make a difference. Uh, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, please allow me to give uh, Jonathan the last word before I wrap up. Any last thoughts? So, yeah, so I, I, I think I started by saying that, that um, I uh, decided to write about these people, but it, it was also a, a, a personal journey for me, mm -hmm. and it allowed me to reflect on my own life. Mm. Um, and, I, and, and I found that also kind of a, a very rewarding experience. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I would like to encourage people just to, you know, to tell stories about uh, 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 mentors, to be mentors, to get involved, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, to, to do the right thing, even when it's difficult, and especially when it's difficult. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in uh, thanking uh, Jonathan with a warm round of an applause. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of uh, this engagement from my side. Um, really, Jonathan, thank you so much for setting time aside to come and talk to us. Thank you for undertaking this project. Um, uh, and, and it is clear from this book, it's clear from what you have shared, shared that you, you, you don't claim to have covered everyone. There are more uh, mentions, uh, you know, that are waiting for many Jonathans of this world to write about them. And I hope this has inspired them to do more. Uh, I picked the point where there, there weren't many or enough uh, women mentions mentioned in here. Hopefully the next book will be about that. I have no doubt the, there is more out there. And somebody said, you know, um, it's not only about the, Jew, Jew, uh, the Jewish community. There are also other communities where very little is known about the contribution that they might have made. I hope this engagement has provided, you know, that, um, you know, uh, encouragement to ever might, um, you know, be thinking about writing something, especially about children, you know, how this has impacted. You talked about uh, trauma, Prof. Um, I attended one seminar where the presenter said something along the lines that trauma is felt by seven generations later. It can be intergenerational, you know, in terms of how this, you know, has affected, you know, seven generations later. But we talk about the mentors who have done their part. What about those now, us today, what are we doing to make that difference? And without expecting anything in return, so that down the line, other Jonathans of the world will say there were mentors that were in the trenches when there was load shedding. There were mentors in the trenches when there was, um, you know, uh, corruption and fraud, you know, people stealing from the poor. When people who claim to be doing things for us, but we know they are doing things for them. If you look at these mentions, they didn't expect to be praised. They didn't expect that there will be a book with their names in it. And I understand why they would say, look, what we did was the right thing to do. We are not heroes. But true heroes, you know, don't wait to be praised, you know, but it doesn't mean we should not give them their flowers. This is what I would say. Some of the things that I picked from this conversation is that, um, you know, as you have said, Jonathan, um, a man leaves the world a better place. One thing that we need to make sure, and it starts now, because uh, many of our students will be leaders tomorrow that will be running this country. I hope something that they take with is that they should not be like the current or some of, you know, you know, who are part of the current cohort, not all leaders are bad, but they are leaders that only think about their own stomachs. They don't care about what their actions, you know, lead to and how they affect the country. Hopefully they'll go there and say, I want to be a mensch, I'm a mensch, you know, I want to do what is right, irrespective of what people are saying. Because what is right should not depend on what one stands to gain financially and so on. So this is something that I'm taking with. And um, another important point that I made a, a note of is that we can be disappointed, but we should not be discouraged. You know, once we start being discouraged and we give up, then we are gone. But we must live in hope and continue to do what is right. And somebody talked about giving up easily. This is something that I always talk about, that I personally think the current generation gives up easily. You know, small thing, you know, bad day, then it's almost like it's a bad life. Sometimes tongue-in-cheek, I said, you know, I wish we should make karate compulsory because karate is about resilience, not fighting, but about resilience, not giving up, you know, you know, having hope and so on. And in times like this is when we need to fight against this tendency of giving up. People leave, you know, because they gave up. But we can't give up on our country because no one will come elsewhere to come and fix it for us. So I thought I should mention that, ladies and gentlemen, doing what is right without expectations or entitlements. How many people call themselves activists these days? And you're like, but this activist is thinking about his or her stomach. This activist is thinking about his uh, or her pocket. Because many of these mentions, mentions did things, you know, without expecting anything in return. The, another thing, those who participated in putting the uh, Freedom Charter together, and now I'm paraphrasing, there's a provision that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. And many of the mentions in this book and what they did, really they believed and lived that, you know. I mean, once again, my favorite, Soli Sachs, you know, organizing uh, daughters of the Africana community called the rebels. 
you know, bringing, not that they should not be organized, but bringing everybody together. In the arts section, we didn't talk enough about it, the gentleman that put together and others, King Kong, who strongly believe that there's so much that people can learn from each other. White people can learn from black people. Black people can learn from white people in terms of arts, which for me is about the unity which we need, because today we are divided according to race, we are divided according to gender. If one villager upsets everybody, then all villagers are bad, and, and so on, of which you get you know, bad villagers, you get good villagers, and these are the things that we need to really emphasize there. And if I could just borrow from the late Mama Miriam Makeba, unifiers don't divide us, you know. Isn't it strong? Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of our engagement. What is left of me is to thank Jonathan for setting time aside to come and chat uh, uh, with us here. Some of the questions were difficult. You know, I said to myself, I'm glad I'm not you. But it's not about you. It's also about, you know, putting this out there as food for thought or thought for food. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to also take this opportunity and thank uh, colleagues you know, at the South African Jewish Board of Deputies. Uh, without that breakfast we had, we wouldn't be here today. Thank you so much for this partnership. I hope we'll do more together. And we are doing more together. Thank you so much. I also want to thank you know, our unsung heroes, people who never get a chance you know, to be seen, but who made this possible. Colleagues from the library, Rineka, you know, I uh, want to single you out. Doesn't mean others are not doing anything. Alrina, I don't want to leave you out. You know, but without the boss, Prof. Maria, nothing can happen. And there are many other people. I don't want to now start mentioning names. Then, then you forget other people. Then you are in trouble. And of course, our colleagues, uh, you know, led by um, uh, Lucky. Uh, thank you so much. I know Ilya was saying, Lucky, Lucky, when I was starting, that I know it's not an easy task. You know, you lead a wonderful team. People have been posting, sharing what is happening here. Thank you, photographers. Each and every one of you, ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate it. We don't take it for granted. When we started with this high tea, people said, people are curious. They will come for the first to see how you are doing as the new vice chancellor. But the auditorium is full again, meaning that really you value this constructive conversation. We don't take this for granted. Please continue to support us. And those that joined us virtually, please continue to support us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. There is tea. It can't be high tea without tea and nice things to enjoy. Please enjoy this with us. Thank you so much. Another warm round of an applause, please, for Jonathan. Thank you. Jonathan, thank you so much. The University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.